This series is a sham. Each episode starts off with a blatantly dishonest premise and then immediately switches its position. Like most evolutionists, the host is resorting to trickery to get views. And to make matters worse, some of the things he says are blatant lies. These are some heavy accusations. I may as well investigate. Before exploring this sham of a series, I should announce that I'll be taking a hiatus from this show for about a month for some personal obligations that I need time for. In the meantime, Christy Winters will be posting a two-part interview she conducted with me. I'll post a link in a reminder video when each part is up. When I come back, I'll be making some minor improvements to this series. When looking for the failures of this series, one doesn't need to look much further than the title sequence. As numerous people have pointed out, I have Noah bringing two male lions aboard the Ark. When creating the animation, I completely spaced the sexual dimorphism of lions. To make matters worse, I have Adam and Eve wearing leaves to cover themselves, but they haven't even eaten the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge yet. I actually did this intentionally because I wanted to avoid a flagging for sexual content. So already I've got scientific and biblical failures. But the biggest failure in the title sequence was pointed out by YouTube user Paul T. Shordell. Put simply, it's way too long. It's the length of a television title sequence. And wow, is it ever irritating when binge watching. When I come back in a month, that will be improved. As I explained in the first episode, examining the arguments as creationists present them led me to a greater understanding of science. I wasn't ever a creationist, but whenever they would stump me in a debate, I'd look up the science behind the argument and usually ended up reading primary source material showing the real science in detail. The details are what ultimately destroy creationism. But a user named Papa John opined that the title and narrative style are dishonest, which destroys my credibility and ultimately destroys any chance of a creationist ever learning anything. Of course, I have no intention of changing the title and format, but I do think it's a valid concern. I'd love to get anyone else's opinion on that in the comments. Another issue some people have had is that there are no sources cited in the descriptions for these videos. I initially thought that showing the paper in the video and naming the publication and publication date would be more than enough. However, I realize that checking references should never be difficult. So from now on, all of my episodes will contain my sources in the description box. I will have sources for past episodes in each of the previous episodes by the time I return. As for out and out errata, in episode 6, I neglected to explain that tidal friction accelerates the recession of the moon because, with all of the other factors, I assumed my case was made. It was also on this video where I had my first crazy commenter. Jason Kelty claimed that this episode was a straw man argument. I had stated that, according to creationists, at the moon's current rate of recession, it would be touching the earth just one million years ago. I got the calculation from Kent Hoven in a debate from 1992, but Kelty was adamant that the correct estimate would be 1.4 billion years ago, so, to be fair, I annotated the video. Even using his calculated age, the creationist argument still fails, but that wasn't enough for him. He invited me to continue the discussion on his page where he could delete comments he doesn't like. Of course, I was overjoyed at being invited to the prospect of being censored. It was the day after I posted this episode that I noticed a sudden spike in my subscribers. After doing a little searching, I found that I'd been given a shout out by a channel I had recently subscribed to called Fishhead Salad. I owe a debt of gratitude for that. It really got the ball rolling, but a simple thank you will have to do for now. In episode 7, Polonium Halos, I mistakenly shortened the decay chain of Uranium-238. I have it breaking down in one step to Uranium-234, as Subduction Zone kindly pointed out. Uranium-238 emits an alpha particle and becomes Thorium-234 before emitting two separate beta decays to become Uranium-234. In episode 10, the Miller-Urey experiment, BYRTDO calls me a liar for claiming 19 of the amino acids needed for life were found in the Murchison meteorite. Because his source is the original paper published in Nature on January 2nd, 1970, he contends there were only six proteinogenic amino acids found in the meteorite. Since the meteorite's discovery, there have been many discoveries. According to Cronin and Chang in a July 2003 article in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, the count is now 
now up to 19. Soon after publishing this, I saw a second spike in subscribers. This episode had the distinction of being cited in a video by Messianic Manic. Again, for now, a thank you will have to do. Episode 11, The Conspiracy Against Kent Hoven was a video I wasn't particularly proud of because it really contained no science. But to my surprise, it is my most popular video to date. As a result, it brought out the paranoid conspiracy theory nuts in full force. There are enough case studies and comments there to base a PhD study on. At about this time, a perfect storm events occurred. Wildwood Claire, who had been watching for a few weeks, gave me a shout out on Coffee with Claire, and Thunderfoot had shared this episode. A sincere thank you to Wildwood Claire and Thunderfoot, two channels I've been subscribed to for years, and two people whose opinions I deeply respect. In episode 12, The Crocoduck, Dutch Liam 84 was good enough to correct my pronunciation of Drosophila. How embarrassing. In episode 13, Darwin recanted, I insinuated that Darwin was deeply religious when he graduated from Cambridge. Lance Wilson was good enough to correct me there. According to Sandra Herbert's Charles Darwin geologist and Michael Ruse's Darwinian revolution, science red in tooth and claw, Darwin was preparing to be a pastor mostly to please his father and because at the time to teach at a British university, you had to be in the clergy. Many people have mentioned that Darwin's recanting, if it had occurred, was wholly irrelevant to the validity of evolution. I actually do discuss this fact in the extended version, available exclusively at Secular TV. At about this time, I had another sudden spike in subscribers. Unexpectedly, King Crocoduck gave me a shout out, and I certainly owe him a big thanks as well. In episode 16, the geological column, I mistakenly placed the debate between uniformitarianism and catastrophism in the time of James Hutton, but as Lance Wilson corrects me, me. Both terms weren't even coined until 1832. My biggest and most embarrassing mistake comes in episode 17. I didn't even notice it until it was pointed out by Andreas Hagen and then Peter S. I confused nuclear fusion with nuclear fission as the mechanism behind the heat and light of the sun. Fission occurs when the atom splits, like an atomic bomb. Fusion is when two atoms are fused together, like in a solar furnace where two hydrogen atoms fuse to form a helium atom. This is what powers the sun. I would really love to shout out some upcoming channels, but I don't really feel I can do anyone much good yet. I think I need about double the subscribers to have any effect. But since I'm about to be on hiatus for about a month, I'd like to share some channels I love, but that have been on a long hiatus. Maybe a few new visitors can get them to start publishing again. The first is Don Exodus. He had some very insightful videos, but now he's silent. He had some great research and even destroyed the scientific descent from Darwinism. Anyone who's spent very much time dealing with creationists has seen this list before. This was published by the Discovery Institute and is a list of roughly 100 scientists who supposedly doubt evolution. This list has 101 signees and reads, We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory could, should be encouraged. Now, the first thing which should jump out at you is the simple fact that this doesn't really mean that they reject evolution whatsoever. In fact, Michael Behe signed this list, and he has no problem whatsoever with common descent. The second is CDK007. For his first few months, he was completely unknown, speaking only in text with pictures and containing complex science with inspiring simplicity. He soon became an authority, but mysteriously became silent again. Finally, one you should just watch from the beginning. Edward Current is a near-perfect emulation of religious zealotry. Every once in a while, he comes back for a single video and promptly disappears again. He was a brilliant satire. Now, I'll be honest. For a while, we creationists have tried to dazzle godless evolutionists with big words like intelligent design and irreducible complexity. But it turns out, scientists actually like big words. And frankly, they just weren't impressed. I mean, even a conservative federal judge appointed by Bush ruled that intelligent design isn't science. So, I am hereby calling on my Christian brethren to bring back good old, God-fearing, biblical creation science. Only this time, let's do it right. 
If there are still any creationists who still watch these episodes, I'm sure they took great joy in seeing me lower myself to admit my mistakes. But I look at it differently. As human beings, we all know we're all imperfect. In admitting mistakes, however embarrassing they might be, we demonstrate that however flawed we might be, dishonesty is not one of those flaws. The greatest scientists admit their flaws and reformulate their theories when needed. Most of the atheists and scientists that I most respect have errata videos, such as Aaron Ra and Potholer54. On the other hand, I have never seen a creationist errata video. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying I've never seen one. Ultimately, the truth is a horizon that we can never reach. But using the scientific method, we inch ever closer. And that's how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.